School Committee to order uh, August 19th at 7.02. Can you all stand for the pledge with me? Comments from the general public? Anyone who would like to come to the mic? Seeing none. Uh, comments from the EAPC? I'll be brief, and then I think Tammy's going to give you a little updates about funding. Uh, I just wanted to say welcome back, everyone. Uh, hope everybody enjoyed their summer. It was quick. I think, um, what did I saw? The MTA posted something on their Facebook. Uh, August is like a, a teacher's Sunday, you know, it's just like it's the inevitable coming. But here we are and look forward for a good year. So I will turn it over to you. Yep. Thanks, Tom. Hi, everyone. Um, Tammy Johnson. Uh, I would just like to, I'm excited, as Tom said, getting ready for my Sunday uh, back. Um, as I was preparing, getting ready for gearing up for this year, which, you know, Scott, uh, Tom and I were talking about the switch from Mondays to Thursdays and adjusting to that. And I was filling out my calendar, so I just kind of wanted to point out, and I was wondering if we could look at March 12th. Um, March 12th is also parent conferences, and so. I personally can't be at two places at once. Um, so if we could just look at that date, that would I really appreciate that. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. And then um, to update, a lot of this summer, um, of myself along with a lot of colleagues have been very busy with our Funder Future. I'm sure some of you are aware. We visited the State House every Thursday. Um, we um, did uh, phone calls, letters, that thing. And the good news is there is extra funding this year that um, they have passed, not a bill, but they have passed in an increase. And Carver, because of this increase, will be getting $30 per student uh, extra at $47,460. Um, not as much. There's a lot of, one of the things that um, we, have, as the MTA, have worked for is getting the funding in places like New Bedford, Fall River, Brockton, Lowell, those places that um, I have a friend that was uh, Brockton uh, uh, High School Library for uh, decades, and that program got um, got eliminated a few years back. And so they, they are getting much more money. Uh, Brockton is going to be getting 8 plus 8 million, Fall River 11 million, and New Bedford 14 million. So that's real exciting, because I truly believe, you know, when our children do better, we all do better. Um, the bad news is this is a one-year deal. So we have a lot of work to ahead of us. There isn't a bill that's actually in place right now. Um, as a matter of fact, there's still things um, on the table of both <coughs> as far as um, mandates and strings attached and things like that. Um, so on that note, so looking forward to this year, to working with you and the community and doing um, and push, pushing as much as we can to get the funding that our schools needs for our children. Um, we are also looking forward to our, our paraprofessionals have been um, very uh, active this summer and really ready to get ready. Um, we met and we're going to be working on an evaluation system, looking at that to kind of see if we can improve that as, um, as well this year. And we're really looking forward to working with you and most importantly, seeing the kids in just a couple weeks. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Tom. Tom. All right, going on to approval of minutes. Um, does anybody have any questions about uh, June 10th, 2019 open session minutes? Are we taking separate um, it, bundle these? It's, or it's your choice. Um, you know, Jason wasn't here for the executive session minutes, so you should probably separate that yeah, out. Let's, let's okay, uh, so we'll do the June. Yep. All right, we'll take a motion then for uh, June 10th. I'll make a motion to approve the open session minutes for June 10th. Second. Okay, we have a motion uh, and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, pass approve uh, unanimously. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the executive session minutes for February 25th. We have a motion and a second. All, all um, approve? Yep. Aye. I abstain. Aye. I abstain. Abstain, okay. Uh, three and one abstention. All right, and I will make a motion to approve the executive session minutes for March 11th. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Abstain. Three and one abstention. Thank you. 
communications. I, uh, we have two communications to share with you this evening. Um, the first is uh, on on the agenda, it's just as the coordinated program review, uh, which happens every six years within uh, every district within Massachusetts. Um, it, the DESI is actually, it's a DESI review of uh, special education, um, civil rights, English language learners, Title I, Title II, Title IIA, uh, basically f a variety of federal and state laws uh, that DESI is required to monitor. And they come out every six years to look for compliance. Um, it actually has a new name. It's now called Tiered Focus Monitoring um, instead of the Coordinated Program Review. And what I'm sharing with you is a letter from DESI uh, stating that they will be coming out to be doing our review uh, the week of March um, 16th, 2020, so this school year. This is a two-year process, and there's going to be a lot more information coming on this. We'll do a formalized presentation in the fall. Um, but there's a series of standards under special education, under ELL, um, under civil rights that we have to show that we're complying with federal and state laws around those issues. And last year, we spent the time actually uploading documents to DESE as our evidence. Um, so this, the work was done by a range of people, including administrators and teachers. Uh, Karen obviously leads the special education piece. Uh, Meredith led the civil rights piece and, and now would also be leading the ELL piece. Uh, Michelle Taylor helped out with the ELP, ELL piece last year, also utilizing staff. Uh, but it does, it does involve a site visit from DESE, so they will be out in the district uh, the week of March 16, 2020. I uh, just wanted to make the community aware of that, wanted to make the community aware of that. Um, and my intention is this fall uh, to do a more in-depth presentation in terms of what are these standards, what does the review process look like, what's going to look like when they come out in March. Uh, in essence, uh, they do some document reviews, some interviews, some on-site visits, um, and they'll be here for either one or two days. And then they give us feedback on how well we're complying with all these regulations. Uh, if there is an area where they have a concern about our compliance, they would give us uh, recommendations and we'd have to do some follow-up with DESI on those specific areas. Um, so I wanted to just make the committee aware of that and more information to come uh, in the coming months about our up, 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 upcoming review. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the second communication uh, is, I think, is well known within the Carver community, uh, but the, the, the town of the Board of Health in the town of Carver um, has uh, instituted a dust to dawn uh, suspension of activities uh, due to the state's recent upgrading of our risk status for triple E to critical. Uh, so obviously the schools are complying with that. So we've asked the people who are using our fields, we've notified them that, you know, in essence, there is no field usage within the Carver public schools or on our fields or on our grounds uh, from dust to dawn. Uh, now, you know, we'll have a little effect as we go into the fall. Um, you know, because obviously we won't be able to have night games uh, unless we have a hard frost or unless the Board of Health drops this requirement. I don't see either one of those things happening for a little bit. Uh, you know, generally, our first hard frost doesn't happen until end of October, beginning of November. Uh, so I think we're going to be in this status for a while. Um, so we'll have to look at our football games. And you know, obviously, we, I think there was some excitement within the community in terms of having some night games on the new turf field. Uh, because we brought that, brought that field online last year. In November, we were able to do a couple night games. I think we did a night game for each sport uh, at the end of last year. Uh, but it would have been nice to have a full season of fall sports and playing some games in the evening, which now uh, we will not be able to do under this ban. So obviously, there's not, nothing we can do about it. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to make the committee aware that we've been notified and that the school district is uh, complying with the ban. Have uh, alternative plans been made for switching night games? We have not. Field, so towers? we have not made alternative plans yet. That's still in the process. Uh, the biggest impact right away would be football, yeah. you know, because obviously football generally plays on Friday nights. Uh, if we're playing in a town that doesn't have a critical ban and they are allowed to play at night, I'm sure we'll still have our night games on Friday night. Uh, we're going to have to talk about what we're going to do for our home games. You know, I think uh, our options are either Saturday morning, Saturday, early afternoon, or we could do earlier on Friday. I think the last time we were in this situation, which to my memory was either 2013 or 2014, mm -hmm. it's been five or six years, is we ended up doing Saturday afternoon football games um, versus Friday afternoon. Uh, just feeling that you know, doing a four o'clock game on Friday was it, it's a little tough on people in terms of getting to the games. Uh, yeah, so, but- I can add on to that too. Um, I would talk to Mike Schultz and to Phyllis, the new AD, um, 
um, in regards to that because our rentals we had were usually on Saturdays and they were looking for field time. We kind of put them in limbo right now because um, if we have Friday night games, obviously our teams get first right to the field. So the thought process was we would probably have football or any other night game that's on a Friday move to a Saturday afternoon. Um, so that will hurt not only revenues for gate receipts, for athletics, for Carver schools, but also our turf revolving account um, will take a hit this uh, fall. Mm -hmm. But obviously it is what it is. There's really nothing we can do with it. Well, our, our, own, our own sports and kids take precedence. So. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, thank you. Want to go right into reports? Yes, thank you. Uh, personnel updates. I'm not going to read through this list. Uh, we've actually had a lot of personnel movement over the summer uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, we've had some internal transfers, which has led to other positions being filled. Uh, we've had some people, some teachers leave the district for varying reasons. Uh, we've, had a, we've actually had a good number of turnovers within our paraprofessionals. Again, a, a lot of those uh, have been for reasons where those paraprofessionals, a couple of them are, have gotten teaching jobs within our own district. Uh, a couple of them have gotten teaching jobs or different jobs in education in different districts that uh, was a positive move for them. Uh, so it, it is a little higher personnel movement than we've had in the past, uh, but I don't think it's indicative of any specific issue or concern. It's just, uh, you know, everybody's individual circumstances led to these moves. What I did do in here for everybody is I did, uh, which we can show up on the screen, uh, just for the committee, uh, we just kind of did an overall uh, personnel update. Mm -hmm. And so people can look through that and see, well, who was a transfer, who were new employees, uh, and who those new employees are replacing. So it gives that kind of list out of all that information for the That's committee. And then what I'll do is, uh, the new teachers, historically, we've invited to the September meeting. Uh, so we'll invite all the new teachers for the, to the September meeting and do some introductions of them. Um, while we're on this topic, uh, just because we're talking about it, um, <clears throat> I know that we've, we said in June that based on some of the movement we've had, there was going to be a positive influence in terms of our budget, uh, in terms of salaries. Uh, we're, we haven't been able to finalize that, because if you actually scroll down this list, we still have a couple of vacant positions. Uh, right now, our vacant positions are in paraprofessionals. Um, but we'll have that all settled out by the start of school. Uh, and so Brad's, Brad's intention in September, September meeting is to give the committee an overview of where we stand in terms of overall salaries. Mm -hmm. So what was budgeted for overall salaries based on the transition, the movement we made, and the hires we have, uh, where we stand in terms of the budget, in terms of overall salaries. And I think Brad will ask you to make some budget transfers at that time. We'll do that in September. Absolutely. The Once biggest fact, too, is we're still getting new hire paperwork for health insurance, which is the biggest variable in all of it. Um, but that on that, I know we mentioned before, a couple of, reach, a couple of you guys reached out to me regarding that $20,000 that we'd like to give back to the uh, town at the end of the year based on the transfer that they made at the beginning of the year for us. Um, that will have to be at the end of the year. Fiscal year will close out of balance. Um, too early to say that we're actually going to have a balance, but we'll uh, see where that goes. But okay. we'll keep that earmarked for transferring back okay. for free cash. So I don't know if there's any questions about uh, the personnel moves. And uh, um, in terms of that update, it should give you a nice clean list of, of uh, what the moves were. That was great. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? No. Now, do you guys do like a hey, – there's a lot on here. So do you – do like a welcoming day for their, the new hires and yeah so we'll do well the, all the new teachers uh, have a two-day mentoring program prior to the start of school uh, so that program already actually happened it was last Monday and Tuesday uh, and then in terms of our professional development days we are doing a welcome back breakfast on Tuesday which is our first full professional development day that everyone's been invited to uh, and then there's a full day Para, there's a full day professional day, which is actually something we negotiated with the paras this year. They used to have a half a, half a day. We used to do a couple hours of training, but we negotiated a full day of training. Uh, so that's going to be on the, the second day, the Wednesday. Um, and we're actually having a, uh, uh, an outside presenter named Tom Murray who's going to talk. Uh, tie, actually ties a little bit into what I'm going to talk about for the educational blueprint next. Uh, but the paras will be there for the full day that day. Uh, so... There is, there is a day where everyone's invited back and we'll do introductions of new staff and, and, uh, and, and kind of make everybody aware of all these changes. All right. All right. Uh, so we're going to uh, educational, educational blueprint. Uh, um, the 
Matt, I think that's the 2017 version. If you can pull up the 2019 version, that'd be great. Uh, the educational blueprint outlines the strategic objectives of the district. Uh, the blueprint has been revised based upon updates and changes to school improvement plans that were reviewed at the June meeting. Um, in the end, the, the blueprint uh, includes the district vision statement, core values, and key objectives. And those items have not changed. Um, so looking at that document, I want to I reference it a little bit. Um, because ultimately, this is our statement of what we feel is important within the district. Uh, so if we look first at the core values, and Matt, I don't know if you can make that a little bit bigger on the screen. So, you know, first we'll go with the concept of these are the core values, the things that we believe about as a school community. That all students can be successful, uh, that learning is ongoing and lifelong, uh, decisions we made in the best interest of students, uh, that everyone should be treated with dignity and respect, uh, and school, home, and community partnerships are vital for continuous learning and growth. Under those core values, we're saying there's, we have four strategic objectives, four key things we want to achieve, which are overarching big picture ideas. And we developed these initially three years ago, and we said at the time that these objectives would at least be three to five years. Um, and it, it interests my reflection on this as I look at this, is saying that these objectives might even be more pertinent today than they were three years ago. Not saying they weren't then. Uh, but even looking at all the movement in terms of SEI and supporting safe schools and looking at the whole child, uh, that's really a focus here within our objectives. Um, so I, I am going to read to you what those objectives are, and then we'll talk some about some of the initiatives and some of the changes within the document. And where the changes occur in this document is really in the initiatives. So there might be some different initiatives that are going to support these big rock, these big picture ideas. Uh, so the first big picture idea is support safe schools to sustain a safe, supportive, inclusive learning environment that ensures we are addressing the physical, social, emotional, and behavioral needs of all of our students to maximize students' capacity to achieve. Like I said, uh, this, is, this might be more relevant now than it was three years ago in terms of having that be a big picture item that we want to look at as a school district to make sure we're doing everything to have a safe, supportive, inclusive environment where students can learn. Second one, engage the community to foster relationships with the community so the parents and community members are engaged partners in the educational process. Uh, enhancing teaching and learning. To sustain a system-wide environment where, where an exceptional instruction and student achievement are the core of our work and realized through collaborative action. Uh, and those are things we can always be improving on. We're always, we always want to work with our, all of our teachers, all of our staff, all of our administrators to ensure that we have a system-wide environment uh, where we want uh, instructional excellence and we want everyone to achieve and have that be the focus of our work and that we all work well together to do that. And then finally, uh, leverage leadership policy and funding. And when, I, when you reread this objective, uh, it really does fit with what, what's happening within what we need to do in Carver. To strategically support the school community with mindful leadership and sustainable funding to ensure the highest level of student treatment, uh, achievement through well-managed resources. Uh, so we have to manage the resources we have well. Uh, we have to have mindful leadership. We have to think about sustainability of funding. And we have to push uh, within our own community and within the community of Carver to ensure that we're going to have a sustainable school environment. Um, so as I said, as an administrative team, when we looked at these four big picture ideas, uh, we said, the, this, is, this is the core of our work. This is what we want to do. Uh, and as I said, and, and we because originally we said three to five years, and we're kind of at the three-year mark. And we're saying, should some of these things be changed? Have our big picture objectives changed? Um, and our answer was no, uh, that these is, this is still the core of what we need to be doing and the core of what we are going to be doing. Um, so what has changed a little bit is some of the initiatives. So in the document that Meredith has up here and that you have in front of you, there's some items in red and some items in blue. Uh, if the item is in red, it's a total, it's a new statement. Um, and if the item is in blue, it's a statement that existed before that we just reworded a little bit, reworded in a different way. Um, so looking at what we've added in red, uh, under support safe schools, uh, implement action plans for safe and supportive school initiatives. So since this document was first uh, agreed upon by the school committee, 
uh, and proposed to the school committee. Um, we've had actually both the elementary school and the middle high school apply for safe and supportive school grants. And we're gonna get an update tonight from uh, both the elementary school and the middle high school in terms of where they stand in those initiatives. Um, so basically we're saying that one of our goals is to implement the action plans that are gonna be, that have been built at the school base level. Um, explore a pilot crusader hour concept. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of depth here. You may hear, I don't think you're going to hear more about this later tonight, but you're going to, you might, I don't know if it's in the safe and supportive piece or not, but it's something we'll explore as we go through the, uh, look at Mike Martin and Mike Schultz. Um, the Crusader Hour is a different concept at the high school level in terms of what we could do in terms of scheduling, uh, so in terms of supporting students so that they would have time during the day to either work with teachers, uh, to get support. Uh, it's a concept that, um, has been utilized in other school districts. Um, and in essence, the concept is during the lunch hour, everyone would be free. And during that time, students would have the availability and the opportunity to, to eat lunch, but they'd also have the opportunity to do some things on their own uh, and to make some choices on their own to get some support from other teachers. And I'm giving you a very rudimentary concept of it. It's something we might talk about more later on, but that's something they want to explore at the middle high school uh, in terms of uh, building an inclusive environment and really giving some students some choice. I think when you give students some choice or some agency, uh, that goes a long way to having them to have buy-in from, from in the school system. But then also it's an important piece because it's an opportunity for students to get a lot of support. Whatever the support is they may need, that support can be indiv individualized and tailored during that uh, um, crusader hour in terms of how they're gonna use that time. So I think that's something you're gonna hear more about as a committee as we go through the year. Um, and then a new phrase, develop culturally responsive communication practices. And this is really, this does come out of the safe and supportive initiative, the SEI movement in terms of really being thoughtful about how we communicate and how we work with all students to ensure we're understanding where they're coming from. Uh, and that's really a key aspect of your work with, any, with anyone, really. I, I was gonna say students, but really, I think that's a key aspect of your effective communication with anybody who you're gonna communicate with is that you're you're being mindful, being thoughtful about where they're coming from, whether it be culturally, whether it be from diversity standpoint, whether it be from their own learning needs. So do you're trying to have that real sense of uh, that person uh, and that we're gonna try to work on that as a, as a school community as we work with each other. Um, the next change under engage the community, uh, develop a marketing plan to celebrate the work of the Cairo Public Schools. Um, so this is something we've talked about as a committee, uh, and this is something that we've talked about that we, I think we need to do a better job at. Uh, and we, we're gonna have some different ideas on how we can approach that. We're making it a goal for this year to really focus on what can we do to sell the great things that happen in Cobb every day. So we wanna increase the opportunities and have more great things happen in Cobb every day, but what are, we, what are we gonna do to celebrate them to make sure the community's aware of them? Uh, in under enhancing teaching and learning, uh, there's one new piece, which is continue to develop um, college and career readiness programs for students. I think this ties a little bit into the Pathways Initiative at the middle high school, and really the concept of what are we doing to ensure that every student is college and career ready. And that's some, that's some discussions we started to have last year, uh, but th that language wasn't within the document, it wasn't within our vision document, it wasn't within the blueprint, and we felt like that uh, language needed to be added. Under enhancing teaching and learning, there's some things in blue which are kind of just rephrasing a little bit different language for some of these bullets. Uh, so provide professional learning in line with faculty and staff feedback uh, and student need, including respectful differences, cultural, family, gender, abilities, et cetera. Um, that statement used to send it, provide professional learning in line with faculty and staff feedback. And so we add the student need piece in because that's part of it too. So as we look at professional learning, we have to look, what, is our, what are the needs of our students within the district? And we need to include that piece. Um, increase the utilization of technology. It used to say increase the utilization of technology by staff and students. And we took off the staff and students and added to promote deeper learning. To really make sure that we're using technology in a, vi in a way that's not just replacement. Because uh, sometimes within, well, I think within all kinds of, whether it be a school district or all kinds of places, the technology is just kind of replacing what you could do with a pen and a paper. Um, and that's not necessarily the goal. So we want to really f focus on and think about how we're utilizing technology uh, to promote critical thinking, uh, to promote deeper learning. And then 
At the end, continue to implement best practices that eliminate barriers to learning. Um, <clears throat> we used to have a phrase in here called Universal Design for Learning, UDL. Um, <clears throat> and really, we rephr rephrased that a little bit to say, part of our goals have to be is as teachers, as administrators, as practitioners in a school system, we need to say, what barriers do our students have in front of us, and what can we do to eliminate or remove some of those barriers so that they can access their education? And, and there's a wide variety of places that can go. Uh, that's a little bit of a language change, uh, but not, not a big picture change in terms of our ideas. And then the last one, uh, under leverage leadership policy and funding, we really thought it was important, which is a restatement of what's up the top of uh, decisions should be made in the best interest of students. Uh, we kind of just added fiscal, make fiscal decisions that are in the best interest of students, saying that we can't, as, we're, as, we've, as we have budget discussions, as we look at what's happening within the school district, we have to really say, what are the best things for our students, and let's try to make fiscal decisions around the things that are the best things for our students. So my wrap up, which is, might be a little repetitive, um, but as my wife always says, I'm good at that. I'm good at saying things uh, multiple times, um, is it really ties back to um, these core objectives. And as a district saying, we want the work that we do as the Carver Public Schools to say, to take whatever it happens, say, ah, yes, I can tie that back to this is about supporting safe schools. I can tie that back and say, this is about engaging the community. I can tie that action back and say, this is about enhancing teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. I can tie that action back and say that this is about uh, leveraging leadership policy and funding. And have really those four things be the drivers of the decisions we make and the actions that we take within the district. And, and that's unchanged. Um, and um, so I'm not, I'm not necessarily looking for a vote of approval from the committee. Uh, it doesn't, that's the, the movement doesn't require a vote of approval, but I wanted to kind of give you an update where we were uh, and tie it back to some of this language comes right from, it kind of refreshes people's memories. Some of this language comes right from the school improvement plans that were presented by Mr. Schultz and Mr. Maestas uh, in June. The, those documents link. So the educational blueprint links to the school improvement plans within each building. And I guess with that, I'll take questions or thoughts or. Anybody have any questions? Or? Well, no, it's just kind of a review on something we've already gone over. So, no, I'm good. Okay. Um, I had one question. How much of this is based on the, I was looking at the PBIS website here. How much is, how much have you taken from this program and in developing? Well, we, we, use, we use PBIS as an, an initiative within the district. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole concept of PBIS is positive behavioral interventions and supports mm -hmm. is that we're going to, have to take a positive message and we're going to, um, we're going to always try to, um, how do I want to phrase this? Uh, we're always going to work with our students in a positive way. Um, so PBIS is a safe school concept. It ties into that whole concept of um, social emotional learning competencies. Uh, developing culturally responsive communication and practices. So some of the things you do through PBIS um, is, is some of the reinforcements we do. So we do with our students, we do all kinds of activities in which they can earn rewards based on positive behaviors. Uh, and that happens throughout the school year. Uh, all of our expectations, so if we look at like expectations for the auditorium, the cafeteria, the hallways, the classrooms, are based on positive statements of what we expect to happen. Mm -hmm. Instead of a negative statement of, don't run in the hallway, mm -hmm. you know, it's a positive state. Everything's paced in a positive manner. Mm -hmm. um, how does that influence the development of this document? That's an interesting question. And PBIS is an initiative under the concept of support safe schools. I don't know if we really thought about as we created this document of we're going to make a PBIS type document that's real positive in terms of its language. Uh, it might be that way. Um, but I wouldn't say that PBIS was a driver of the creation of this document. I was just it, curious, because in, in the first the safe, support safe schools, but when I was looking at the website, one of the things would I, actually end with you talking right now is uh, the develop, development of the marketing plan to push a, a kind of a school district in a positive way. Which we definitely of, want to do. Instead of us, because it's easy to get on the negative, you know what I mean? It's, it's, but it's much better to go on the positive. Absolutely. Um, 
I think it's great. I, I, I was. I, I think you've done a, all your team has done a lot of work on this, and um, it's interesting to see the different, different, um, all the different goals and objectives and initiatives that you want to push forward. Yeah, you know, and then obviously our goal would be at, at in the spring we come back and say this is kind of an update. These, are the, this is the actions we've taken on these initiatives uh, throughout the year. Terrific. All right, uh, moving on. Safe and supportive schools. Yeah, I'm ready. Are you done with that one? I'm ready, yep. Yeah. Uh, so for safe and supportive schools, I'd like to invite up uh, Ms. Maestas and Mr. Martin. Uh, as you're aware, both the elementary school and the middle high school have been awarded safe and supportive school grants. They're actually in different places. The uh, elementary school applied for their grant first a year prior to the middle high school. Uh, so in the implementation stages, they're a little bit ahead. Uh, and But they've received grant funding for two years, and they're looking for a third year. Uh, and the middle high schools received grant funding for two years. So they're going to kind of give us an update on uh, what's been happening in terms of our safe and supportive school grants. And I don't know, Rube, I don't know sure, who wants to go first. Yep. Rube's going to go first. Good evening, everyone, and welcome back. I'm very excited to be back and to be here tonight. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to give you a, a bit of an update. We've been talking about safe and supportive schools for the last few years, and we were fortunate at the elementary school to be awarded the um, $10,000 grant. So with that um, being said, I just really wanted to share with you that it's been a great opportunity, really, in reflecting back on the work that the Safe and Supportive team has, has done. We were, because of the grant at the elementary school, we were able to pool together several teachers, paraprofessionals, counselors, community members. Um, to really look closely at a, at, a, at a tool, a behavioral assessment tool that was designed by the Department of Elementary Secondary Education. With this tool, it, um, we focused very closely on questions that it asked us about our school in terms of what we were doing or what we needed to do to be a safe and supportive school. And a safe and supportive school is really, you know, what, is, what are we, it, it's um, providing opportunities to ensure that we are being nurturing, caring, supportive for everyone, not just the kids, the staff. So it's really about that nurturing, caring, supportive approach for everyone. So <clears throat> because of the grant, we were able to look closely at, um, at several of these, these um, through, through the tool, we were able to look closely, have some really good dialogue about what we're doing at the elementary school, and then focus on two or three areas of concern. We were also put in a position to work very closely with a consultant um, who has worked with um, the DESC, worked for Harvard, helped to write the book on trauma-sensitive schools. I've talked a little bit about him before, Joel Rustuccia, but he was able to come and have face-to-face -face meetings with us at the elementary school, all a part of this grant. So in reflecting up upon that, I felt like I really just needed to <clears throat> kind of remind us about that because we've we've come a long way. So the three areas at the elementary school, if you can uh, slide to the next slide for me, um, were professional development, um, both in academic and non-academic supports, policies, procedures, and protocols, and collabor collaboration with families. Those are the three areas that sort of like rose to the top as we were having dialogue with our team. Um, so. To give you an overview of where, um, where we are now with regard to the professional development piece, what we did last year is we, um, <clears throat> we determined that our, our staff really wanted some more support with um, social emotional learning and responsive classrooms. So la this time last year, we uh, welcomed a trainer from responsive classroom who came and did a one day training with our school teachers. Um, we were also able to look very closely um, and work as a team with our counselors to research and select a tier two uh, social emotional program. We were able to buy resources really 
to focus on this area. So we purchased a tool called the DESA Mini Screener. It's a research-based tool that's been used throughout the country, but it, we're, we're using it a lot in Massachusetts now. And what it is, it's a one-minute screener. It's very user-friendly. It's a screener that um, teachers received some training on, and they were able to answer a series of eight short questions that would then give us a, a synopsis of a child's um, social-emotional strengths and weaknesses. From that, we were then able to uh, determine if children needed a more extensive, more extensive support, and a more extensive tool was then used as well with the teachers. And then from there, we were able to um, purchase our actual tier two program. So we're, we are using Second Step. We looked at several other programs, but we came back to Second Step, which um, is again another research-based social emotional learning tool that our counselors were able to then focus on those students who sort of like rose to the top that had some weaknesses that we really needed to focus on so fortunately through all of this entire process we were able to start our um, social emotional learning tier two program in march of last year so we're sort of like in the infant stages um, but <clears throat> We are looking at that data and we'll continue to refine the process and we will continue to implement tier two at the elementary school starting within a few weeks of when school starts. Um, we were also able to work closely in our data meetings and combine our, uh, we had data meetings for math and ELA. Now we encompassed social emotional learning data into, into that those um, data meetings. So that's been a very big plus for us at the elementary school. Then we were able to also look closely at our policies, <coughs> procedures, and protocols. As a result, our team looked at our code of conduct. We talked a little bit about some of those, those things around PBIS that Mr. Neef was mentioning. And really, it's really looking at um, <coughs> ensuring that when we're working with children, let's say they've been referred to the office for some reason, that we're working with them to, in a, in a non-punitive fashion, that we're really supporting them, that we're using um, um, research-based um, um, strategies and approaches that are gonna help these children to sort of correct their behavior and not repeat, repeat it over and over again. So it's all kind of tied into together. We were able to revise our code of conduct um, and also start a, some research on restorative justice. So we have uh, Mrs. Dawson is actually working closely on that. So let me just mention that also. So the professional development academic um, portion, Mrs. Foley oversaw that with several staff members. Mrs. Dawson oversaw the policies, procedures, and protocol piece. And then the, the other piece, the, C, the collaboration with families, is an area that I took and we worked on together. So as a result of the work with the team, we determined that we needed to conduct a yearly family survey. So we've done that. We're in the second phase of that so far. We've partnered with um, different community organizations, such as the South Shore Family Network. Um, part of what came out in the family survey was parents wanted some more parenting classes, so we were able to put together some mini workshop classes, and we will be going into year two with that. And they also wanted to add, add family engagement opportunities, such as like the movie night. We had the pizza, um, the, it was like a pasta dinner in November that we had. So things like that is what we're hearing our parents want us to continue to have and then continue to host our wellness fair. So <clears throat> all of those things are up and running. You know, and if I, I, I thought about it, and I thought, well, would we have been able to do this without the grant? Maybe so, but what's always um, challenging is kind of bringing teams together. And the grant really helped to provide opportunities after school to sit with people and, re and with teachers and the paraprofessionals and just have some really good dialogue about what we need to do. So <clears throat> um, one of the things we're looking forward to because another grant has become available to Carver Elementary School, another $10,000. So we just completed that grant um, <clears throat> and we'll see if we're awarded that. But one of the expectations for that grant 
is that the, the, if we get it, they would like us to offer mentoring support to other districts. So they'd expect us to go out and meet with the DESC and, and they have like a fall, winter and spring meetings where they bring other districts together and we would be uh, sort of a mentor school. So that's, that's one thing that they would like us to do if we're awarded it, which is a nice thing. It's great to be able to showcase and talk about what we learned, mistakes we've made, and then help to guide other districts. So other things that we're looking forward to, um, separate from the whether we get the grant or not, uh, family and community engagement opportunities. So we want to do a school-wide fall, fall bulb planting project. Uh, we want to do a STEM Saturday or something like that, um, maybe a STEM evening or a STEM Sunday, but all, all around parent engagement, and then uh, movie night possibly in the winter, and then continued partnerships with South Shore. So just a little synopsis. Do you have any questions? Good. I, I have one. Um, do you have to report back anything to the people who gave you the grant? To the like, DESC, so we yeah. do. Um, we do. We actually have to submit uh, information on. Um, we have to send them an action plan, and the results of uh, not the results, but sort of the progress. And we do have to report to them. Um, I believe it's twice. I'm not sure if Meredith also has a piece to it. Okay. No. Was that the was that the strings attached for this this grant? No. No, was there anything that was required of us for the 10,000 that you have now? That's a good question. I'll, I'll have to get back uh, to I think, well, I think the requirement was yeah. you had to develop the plan and right. submit the plan. Right. You to sit, so yeah. you had to develop an action plan of how you were, gonna, in, how you were going to implement uh, safe and supportive school uh, activities, and then you had to, set, you had to send the plan back to DESE, I believe. Yeah. But that, there was no other. There was no other. There was no other uh, piece of it. And these kind of operate as continuation grants. Right. So I don't know if there's a lifespan on there. Is it two or three years? Did they save funding? Yeah, I just think that every year they look at what they have left and how many more districts they can bring on board. Mm -hmm. But they definitely incentivize it by having phase one being the planning part. So they give you a certain amount of money so that you can just do data analysis, figure out where your weaknesses are. And then you can um, apply for the implementation. I just didn't know if I just didn't know if there was a requirement for that first that first round. Like there were the, requirements for all of them. Right. So, okay. <laughs> so I figured. Yeah. But it's good. Oh. System and checks and balances. Well, thank you. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? Okay. So, yeah, thank you. So we'll okay. transition to the middle high school where, where they are within that safe and supportive schools grant. Thank you. Good evening. Mike Martin, the assistant principal at Carver Middle High School. Uh, I was told I didn't need fancy slides like uh, Mrs. Maestas. Uh, no, it wasn't you. It was someone else. Um, so uh, we just kind of dipped our toe in the water uh, regarding um, Safe and Supportive Schools grant. Uh, this is my first year in Carver. And in October, I was approached by uh, former principal Mrs. Hawley. And she said, we're going to be running this grant. So Safe and Supportive Schools was fairly new to me. You guys are all experts with safe and supportive schools. Uh, I'm sure you could recite the definition for safe and supportive schools, but in case you uh, forgot, I have it right here just so that we know what a safe and supportive school is. So according to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, a safe and supportive school is a school that fosters a safe, positive, healthy, and inclusive whole school learning environment that assists students to develop positive relationships with adults and peers, regulate their emotions and behaviors, achieve academic and non-academic success in school, and maintain physical and psychological health and well-being. Okay, so that's quite, that runs the gamut there. Uh, so we are phase one of the grant, and what we did last year, starting in October, uh, we formulated a school-based team of administrators, uh, admin, uh, admin assistants, teachers, counselors, uh, parents, and our job was to look at, as, as um, Mrs. Maes has mentioned, the behavioral health and public school assessment tool. We call it the BHPS uh, tool. And what it does is it kind of drives you to reflect on where, the where are you with regards to being safe and supportive. And it covers, it covers six indicators um, in really the kind of school operations. So the first indicator is leadership. You know, how are you? 
safe and supportive with regards to leadership, then professional development, access to resources and services, academic and non-academic activities, school policies, procedures, and protocols, collaboration with families. So those are the six areas, or they call them essential elements, um, that you have to reflect upon and really give yourself a grade. So that smaller group, uh, we kind of went through the tool um, and we kind of arrived at some conclusions and then we took the tool, modified it a little because the language was uh, very technical and then we gave the survey to our staff. Uh, what we found is that our whole staff their results really mirrored what that smaller, more uh, intense group said. These are our areas of strength, and these are our areas of concern. Um, with that being said, we had to develop an action plan. So phase one, we got, I believe at the high school, we get 7,500. Um, I don't know why we didn't get 10,000, but 7,500 is a good chunk of change. Um, in order to, to apply, so currently we're just applying for phase two and we had to develop an action plan based on our areas of weakness. What are some of the things that you're gonna do to address those areas of weakness? So just to give you an idea of where we identified our areas of weakness, and I can definitely send a copy if people would like to look at this uh, a little more uh, at their leisure. Uh, but one of the areas was uh, where we scored, you know, average or below average, uh, the statement was student-centered, safe and supportive schools focus on improvements for all students. And I think, you know, we wrestled with this statement, and a lot of the statements are generally vague because this is a tool that has to probably take into account every school in Massachusetts and all the different variances that they have. So um, I, I think our staff understood that, yeah, we support many students, but I don't know if we do a great job of supporting every student. Uh, I think that was really the focus. Um, so to address some of those things, we have a bunch of initiatives that are gonna cost money, and we have a bunch of initiatives that I think just, whether it be administrative practices or classroom practices by teachers or other personnel that we can implement to make things a little more safe and supportive. One thing that we're gonna do, uh, I did this when I was a assistant principal at my uh, former school, is there's a national initiative called Shadow a Student Challenge where I actually chose a student and I met them at the bus stop and I went to all their classes, I went to lunch, uh, I went to their after school uh, and it was the most exhausting six and a half hours of my life. Um, and we think that students, one thing that we took from that is that students don't get a prep. Our teachers contractually get a prep. And you know, sometimes that prep is, you know, it doesn't feel like a prep as a teacher, but our students don't get a prep. And we, we assume that they get a break, but they're literally running from classroom to classroom, definitely at the high school. Uh, then they run to lunch and people, oh, lunch is a break and it's really not. So the stress that our kids are under from the time they enter the school until the time they leave and they have to respond to bells and they have to get up and they have to run. Um, so this Shadow Student Challenge, um, it is a national initiative, you can just Google it. Uh, there's a lot of really great feedback, but we're actually gonna use some of the grant money uh, where we're going to um, have 10 of our teachers, uh, we're going to select uh, really a cross section of the student body and they're going to obviously ask them and their parents if they would like to participate in this Shadow a Student Challenge. And really just to look at what do our students endure on a daily basis. Uh, and it's not just they come in the building and it's the academics in front of them because they all come with a different set uh, of stuff. Um, they come with some baggage. And we wanna make sure that you know we have our uh, kid that's doing four AP classes who's under a, tremen a tremendous amount of stress, people that are uh, maybe socioeconomically not as well off. We want uh, students uh, uh, with disabilities. So we want to make sure that we get a really good cross-section and then have those teachers really kind of go through and experience a school day in their shoes uh, and then really report back to the staff. And, and it is a really powerful, it's a really powerful exercise. So um, if any school committee members want to participate, let us know, um, and we can Meaning you, you up. shadow me for the day? So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll switch jobs for the day. So that is one initiative where we are looking to um, kind of uh, address the student-centered, safe and supportive schools fo um, focus on improvement for all students. So that's one initiative that we're hoping to get a really uh, some good feedback. Uh, some other uh, things that we're looking to do is uh, we're going to create a UR important wall where we're going to 
um, use the IPASS photograph of every single student, and eventually, probably in October, we're actually going to model this for uh, our staff uh, in the first three days, where uh, we're going to take a their picture and their name, and we're just going to write something poignant and meaningful about that one student, so that every student can see their face and they can see something positive that's written by a teacher. It's not going to be signed by a teacher. It's just you know we're going to ask our staff if they can identify a student that they that they know that they can say something positive about. Because I think um, even though we are a small school system, kids can still f uh, fall through the cracks. And we want to make sure that every student is acknowledged uh, positively in one way or the other. Uh, another area of concern that we had was um, the statement, creating inclusive and caring classrooms and school culture deepens and enriches students' social and emotional competen competencies. Uh, so. In addition to the Shadow Student Challenge, our PBIS team, uh, which is run by Mrs. Cabral uh, and a bunch of teachers and counselors, uh, they piloted a check-in, check-out uh, initiative this year, which was they identified about six or eight students who were really kind of struggling with um, the rigors of school. They were in danger of failing some classes. And what they did is they, they met with, this, with these students and they said, is there an adult in the building who you have a positive connection with? and you're gonna have a, a check in every morning and you're gonna have a check out. And there was a couple of students that, that I kind of oversaw uh, that I had to meet because of whether it be discipline or tardies. Um, and once they enrolled in that check in check out where again, they have this positive interaction with an adult, um, it was a complete 180. So we're looking to um, expand on that check in check out. Um, to really, again, target those students that might be falling through the cracks or might need just some extra supports. Uh, the last um, <clears throat> uh, couple, couple more things. So uh, a process is in place to provide transition age planning and services to students. That was uh, one of the areas that uh, our staff reported that there were some relative weakness or an area of concern. And, and since then, uh, we decided that we we're going to do a ninth grade uh, freshman orientation day. Uh, the thought was always, well, the ninth graders are in the building. You know, they, they know, you know, we don't really have to handhold them as much. But uh, we should all know that ninth grade is a pivotal year. And if you fail a class in ninth grade, your chance of graduating with your peers uh, gets reduced drastically. So we think it is important as a lot of High, traditional high schools have uh, freshman academies. I think we can do a lot more to support our, our ninth graders, even though they've been in the building for three years. So uh, the start of that is going to be uh, in a couple of Wednesdays on the 28th. We're going to have a freshman orientation day. Guidance are going to come in, going to do some team building stuff. Uh, and they're really just going to get us a, a sense of what it means to be a high school student nice and early. Uh, and the last thing that the grant's going to pay for, and um, we don't want this to be some type of top-down, well, you know, the assistant principal says this is safe and supportive and we have to do it. So uh, we are going to create what's called a safe and supportive ambassador team where we're really going to, it's almost like a train the trainer concept where we're going to get um, uh, four or five individuals from our school. Uh, they're going to do a bunch of the training on safe and supportive and they're really going to be the, the, the overseers of a lot of these initiatives. So um, I think unlike the elementary school, I know um, Ms. Maestas and her team kind of purchased a program, but there's obviously a bunch of uh, other stuff that they're doing. So we we have a real smorgasbord of really things that we're looking to do. So we, we hope we're on the right track. Okay. So. Sounds like it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Matt. Do we have any questions? questions yeah, thank comments? you both very much for coming in and letting us know uh, the plan. Um, Ruby, you come in often, so uh, we, you always have uh, a lot of great things to say. Uh, Mike, this is one of the first times I think we've had you come in and really speak and yep. you have a lot of great ideas so I'd be very interested maybe halfway through the year kind of revisiting this and seeing Definitely. you know where we're at because some of these initiatives I thought they were fabulous so I'd like to see where you go with them thank you just to let you know when you get the ten thousand dollar grant that's when you get the fancy slides oh that's, <laughs> that's what the extra 2500 was for that's, that's what that's the extra 2500 it's expensive thank you very much thank you all righty. Uh, field update. <clears throat> update on fields. Um, so as an update to fields, both the middle high school and the elementary school. First, let's start with the elementary school. Um, at the elementary school, the fields are still the responsibility of Central Nurseries, the contractor for the project. And that is until November 15th. 
Uh, they are currently cutting and fertilizing the fields. Uh, they're actually going to be reseeding um, all the fields at the elementary school the last week in August. And then they're going to continue maintenance, fertilization, and cutting throughout the fall. So anything that's considered phase two in the project is still owned by the landscape management company. Uh, in general, it's outside the fire loop. Um, so the areas around the building are all considered phase one, and we are now own and manage that, and our custodial services are cutting the lawn, weeding, and has a fertilization plan for those areas. And those areas actually look okay, they look pretty good. The fields, there's a concern about where the fields stand at the elementary school. And also is I think that they just planted way too late last year. So the first, they first planted that, that those fields probably in October. Uh, and they just didn't take real well. They took a little bit. There was a little bit of germination, but not, not really well. Um, and then, you know, when they started with nothing, it's been hard for those to really grow that much this spring and the summer. Uh, but ultimately, uh, that is still the responsibility of, um, of the contractor, and we're going to hold them to meet their responsibility and meet their obligation. Uh, so there is some funds that have been held back from that contractor. Uh, so the district, uh, the town still owes them money and will not uh, complete payment for their phase of the project until we have the fields that we're supposed to have. Uh, we've met with the management team from Central Nurseries over the summer. Uh, so the, I haven't been doing a monthly building committee update. Uh, the building committee, the, the, the subcommittee, right. Um, that met weekly with the building team. That group still meets bi-weekly. We're still meeting. Um, and so we're staying on top of every little piece of the project. Uh, and so we have met over the summer, uh, every two weeks. And one of those meetings actually included, was specifically to meet with Central Nurseries to walk the fields, talk about our concerns, uh, and you know, have them in essence give their assurances that uh, they're gonna meet their end of their responsibilities and that we'll have appropriate fields with real grass uh, by the end of November, by the time they, they turn that piece over. Um, and that was always the design of the project. It was phase two was not going to be completed until this fall. Um, so uh, we'll, you know, we'll see how that goes. Uh, as I said, they have scheduled to reseed uh, right before the beginning of school. Uh, and they'll be uh, fertilizing and growing those areas. And hopefully we'll see uh, a much thicker lawn out there. Because right now, if you walk out on the fields of the elementary school, they're pretty sparse. Um, and we will hold them to their contractual responsibilities. And that's something that is handled by the subcommittee as far as yeah. before. Yeah, so the that you know, so the the technical review committee, the TRC, uh, which meets bi weekly, uh, that includes myself and Bill Harriman and John Del Pascoli and Mike Milanowski and Ruby and Dave Seedentoff. Uh, that as we've managed the project, the entire project from the beginning, uh, we're still managing that piece through to the end. And you said they meet Bi weekly Right now we're meeting bi-weekly. During the, during the year, we met on a weekly basis when the building was really in full swing of construction. You know, ultimately our goal is to close out those meetings. Uh, and you know, there's very few things left on the list to be done. You know, I don't know if you noticed that uh, the sign went up. Yep. Uh, so the, the electronic sign board went up and there's gonna be a training on that for Ruby and the elementary staff tomorrow. Uh, over the weekend, they finally did the berm. Uh, so I don't know if people noticed that driving. I don't know if you came back into town too late, but that area along Route 58 has been redesigned. Uh, the plant, the plantings are going in supposedly. Uh, sometimes we know when. Sometimes we're told when things are going to happen. They always happen that way. But the current plan is that the plantings will be going in tomorrow and Wednesday, uh, and we're going to be cleaning up that area. So at the beginning of school, that's going to have the plantings and the berm, and they're going to be planting grass over there. Now we're not going to have grass there until the fall. Uh, but that is all. That work's been happening. Those, those are kind of. The, there are some pieces on the exterior. We have a couple of plants that have died. Uh, we have a couple of areas of plantings that need to be redone over by the right side by the entrance. There's a section that needs to be replanted. Uh, our, la our landscape architect has actually requested that, that not be done until mid-October. Uh, she believes, her name was Iris, uh, she believes that planting that in, in uh, late August would actually be detrimental to some of the plantings that need to go in. Um, so yeah, we're still managing all those pieces of the project. And I, I mean, I wanted to take some time to talk about that tonight because I do think that uh, there's a little bit no one has expressed this to me directly. But my sense is that people might be driving down Route 58 and going, I feel like there's some undone pieces here. Uh, and, 
and just so I want the community to know that uh, we're going to tie up all those loose ends, uh, that the team is still working on that. You know, that the project is, and sometimes that's the hardest thing, is the project is 99.6% done. And the reality is the general contractor has moved on to another project. Um, you know, so they're still part of our biweekly meeting, mm -hmm. but they're not on site every day. Uh, and, and all these other contractors have moved on. And what, I, what I've learned through this process is sometimes the hardest, uh, hardest percent to get done is the last 1%. <laughs> you know, so we get to 99% completion, then it's getting that one last percent done and cleaning that stuff up. And, but we're, we're doing that and we're on top of that. And, and the thing that I'm most concerned about personally is, is the fields. Uh, and ultimately, we're going to hold hold, back uh, hold them responsibility, and we have we've ha we have held back yeah. uh, funds from them, and they will not receive payment until we have the fields that are required under the project. The same with the other contractor that's doing the berm. Do we still owe them money as well? So that them? that was a that was a little bit different situation. Uh, the the berm was not part of the original project. Uh, if you actually go back. Um, what was originally designed was we were going to maintain the tree line there. That's right. And then what happened was uh, two, it, it's amazing that when we actually started construction on the building, this, you know, we're into the year three of real construction here. Mm -hmm. uh, so two winters ago, not last winter, the winter before, we had those three bad storms. And we lost about a third of the trees along Route 58. They were pines. Um, and then it became, we were looking at it going, this is now it's just kind of a spotty pine. It was a row of pines along Route 58. It became no longer a row of pines. So there were two concerns there. One was that it just didn't look that great with a pine here and there. And second, uh, I, I would never uh, say that this is my area of expertise, but people tell me that uh, a pine standing alone isn't a good thing, that eventually it's probably going to fall. Uh, and so the concern was that even the pines that were left, that over time that they would fall. Um, so we actually made a new plan the new plan is we, we made a decision to cut the pines down, build the berm, and do the plantings. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're going to do some hardy, hardy, hardy shrubbery along the berm uh, as to create a barrier with Route 58. Um, and what happened was that was actually outside of the project. Um, and we're, gonna, we're getting into the weeds here a little bit, but I want to give some explanation as to why we are where we are. Uh, that was outside the project, and so we actually made a, an agreement with one of the contractors, uh, Robert B. Hour, and we actually made a trade, and we traded one thing off for another thing for them to do the berm, um, and, and then what happened was they completed the project. They were looking to get their site work done, um, and they actually entered into a little bit of a dispute with the general contractor, CTA, uh, in which they felt they had not been fully paid, uh, so they held up doing the berm until they felt they had full payment. Uh, so once they receive full payment, they move forward with doing the berm. Uh, so that's why the berm has sat and not been done for two or three months. Um, so, but that, they've been, full, our, Robert Biauer has been fully paid. CTA is where they are supposed to be. Uh, the berm has been constructed. Uh, it was cleaned up this past weekend. And the plantings and all that should be happening over the next few days. And, and the planting should be in place for the beginning of school. Uh, I know that wasn't necessarily a field update, but it's a general construction update, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, when we were in the midst of the project, we had a construction update at every meeting. Mm -hmm. And since we've been, since we've been at the 99% completion piece, we've kind of dropped that. But then there's uh, like, sort of like everybody else, there's kind of all these, these couple small pieces out there that are being tied up. And mo most of them have been tied up now. We're at a point where there are very few odds and ends left, uh, but the biggest one being the reseeding of the fields. Okay. Thank you. Uh, at the middle high school, uh, we do currently have an outside vendor doing all the fertilization of the fields uh, that are in operation. So there is a full fertilization plan in place, and those fields are being fertilized. Uh, the Upper Pond Street field is currently not in operation. Um, we do have irrigation on the baseball diamond, on the Pond Street field, and there's full irrigation on everything inside of the new project within the new, the new football field and track area. Uh, that all has irrigation. 
Um, we do have wells in place, to, but we need to add irrigation lines if we wanted to irrigate the rest of the fields at the middle high school. And that's just going to become a, you know, we've had that priced at various ranges from anywhere from seventy-five dollars to $100,000 to put in all those irrigation lines to do those fields. And that's just going to be a capital discussion that we can have as a committee in terms of what's our priority for that and then bring that to the town and see what the town's priority is to have irrigation on the remainder of the fields. Uh, you know, obviously, having irrigated fields would put us in a better position in terms of appropriately maintaining those fields as well. Uh, but though I, I think those fields are in better condition than they've been over the last couple of years, um, and so we need to keep working on that. And then we also have to start going towards our field restoration plan. We had developed a plan to where we we're going to rotate through in terms of the restoration of the fields, which we have not begun to implement that plan. Some of that falls a little bit on having field space available at the elementary school. So we're waiting on hold a little bit to make sure that the elementary fields are up and running uh, and in place. Because we were really hoping that that was going to be this fall. That the original plan, you know, if we went back three years, was that this fall, the fall of 2019, the elementary fields would be open for full use. And then we were going to start talking about closing down some of the fields at the middle high school and reseeding them and redoing them. So that's on hold a little bit until we feel like we have all the fields in place at the um, elementary school. Um, so that's kind of a, a generic update in terms of where we stand in, in terms of fields uh, under the control of the Cabra Public Schools. Okay. Do okay. you have any questions or comments on the field Thank issue? Thank you. I need that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll uh, just add on to that. There is, one, there is a small balance left in the middle high school project, track and field project, that is available to use for irrigation on other fields. Okay. Um, it's just a matter of, again, sitting down and getting a final number and mapping out where we want them to run. Right. So that is 40,000 off to 75 to 100, depending on where we fall. Actually, and we can, uh, you know, select to do a certain, you know, certain fields that we want to get done. Yep. I actually have one question on this topic now that I just thought of it. <coughs> um, the outside vendor for fertilization of the fields in operation, why, why, are we, why do we have an outside vendor doing this and not the town? I think that that's or just our personnel. just based on the, the utilization of our personnel. Uh, that they don't, we don't have the manpower to have them be able to maintain the fertilization and do all the fertilization necessary uh, to get it done. Actually, there's a lot. There's a, it's a quite intensive. There's a you need licensing to drop certain things, and it's just easier to contract it out. Okay. Um, the town is managing that contract. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. So it includes, felt I had to ask that, contract, that question. Um, I talked to Dave about this last week. The contract is beyond just our field as well. It's for um, the contract is for the whole town. Purchase Street. Street. It's all the, it's all King the town Street. fields. Yeah. King Street, so yeah. is so this something we're splitting with the town cost wise, or is this part yeah, of that line? Part item. of that line. That line item that, that we okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. I, Wait, school Shield school Grant. School Shield Grant. Uh, last year, and Mike Schultz has really taken the lead on this. Mike, you don't have to, I didn't ask Mike to present, but if we have a question, maybe we'll direct it towards him if I feel, I'm, I might shift the question to him. Uh, maybe not, we'll see how it goes. Uh, uh, last year, actually, School Resource Officer Wall approached the Middle High School Administration about grant opportunities through Motorola to bring in new radios for the district. Uh, so Motorola actually assists in the grant writing process. Uh, last year, with the assistance of a grant writer, we applied for what's called the School Shield Grant. Uh, we were notified over the summer that we received a grant in the amount of $22,499 to purchase all new radios for the district. Uh, with the grant funds, we're going to be able to purchase 64 radios, 32 for each building, 32 for the middle high school, 32 for the elementary school. Uh, and f four of the radios, two at each building, will be police radios, in which we'll be able to have direct communication with Calvary Police and Fire through the radio system. Um, the new radios really will up greatly upgrade our safety and security within each facility. Uh, and the new radios should, we should be in place for the first day of school? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, and I just, I just gave the invoice for the radios. But ultimately, the radio communication that we had, the radios we were using, sometimes it was faulty within the building. We weren't getting a good signal. Uh, we didn't feel like we had enough radios. So we felt like there were people who should have radios who didn't. Uh, and this was really an opportunity to upgrade that system. Uh, and there were grants out there to do this. Obviously, there's a lot of grants out there in terms of school safety and security. Uh, this grant was very specific in terms of supporting the, the purchase of radios for school safety and security. 
Uh, so I, I want to thank Mike for his work on this because him and uh, he really is the person who took the lead in the district on uh, acquiring this grant. Um, but I wanted to make sure the committee was aware of it and that, let them know that we were going to have uh, all new radios in place for the school year. And I think it's really important that we're going to have those yeah. two radios in each building that have Great. that are police radios that have direct communication uh, to both police and fire. Terrific. How many? Uh, so the sixty. 64 total, 64 32 total? at each school. 32 will be at the elementary school, 32 at the middle so school. So there's some, something for every? Not every teacher. Uh, so the, the administration on each building will kind of make that determination of who has a radio. Uh, all the administrators will have one, probably all the counselors. I don't know if you guys want to address who's going to have radios in your building. And not the specific 32. You don't have to give you the 32 names. It's, but It's going to be, um, there's a lot of. Like a lot of programs in the, in the building that, that didn't have access, whether it be our, our special ed programs or phys ed or people going out of the building or uh, counselors. Uh, there's some, there's some build, spots in the building. We're in the dead spots with the PA, so right. people in the cafeteria will have them. So it's really having uh, better communication, better access throughout the entire building. I mean, I think we had um, maybe 12 to 15 radios right. before, so we were definitely short. And the mm -hmm. radios we had were inadequate. They were um, low right. level. I think this is great. I mean, because if something, you know, God forbid, you know, nothing, nothing happens, but, but God forbid, you know, something happens. I mean, um, having announcements over the PA is not going to do anybody any good. But a direct contact with the radio is uh, much, much more secure and uh, much more direct. Um, in an emergency, it will be much more efficient. You know, but like I said, when you're, we've had these conversations about school shooter issues, and you don't want to be putting stuff over the PA, you know, trying to contact people. You know, so I think this is great. Anybody else? Came out of, this came out of a conversation with Officer Wall when we did a drill, yeah. and there was some spots. And he said, you know, a lot of the training says the best means of communication is radio in these situations. Right. And our radios were inadequate. So he actually brought the Motorola solution concept to, to us, and we went through the process. It was a great process. The grant writer worked with us and um, really helped us find a grant that they felt was gonna we were going to be awarded. I mean, they accelerated that. So we did have we did have to pay for the assistance of the grant writer, two thousand, uh, but obviously that had a return of a grant of twenty two thousand. Yeah, that's great. Anybody else have any questions or no, it's comments? Great. It's great. Right. Thank you. All right. so, um, wellness policy. Wellness policy. Uh, recommendations. Uh, so the district's well again. This is uh, both Meredith and Mike are very active in the on the wellness committee. Uh, didn't again didn't ask them to make a formal presentation tonight, but made direct questions in their direction. If you have some, um, the district's wellness policy is required to be periodically reviewed and updated uh, by the wellness committee uh, and approved by the school committee. Uh, last year, Mr. Schultz, who originally chaired the wellness committee when the plan was first adopted, uh, reformed the wellness committee to review and recommend revisions to the current policy. The policy was originally approved in 2006, then it was revised again in 2013. Uh, the members of the wellness committee included teachers, administrators, uh, director, of food, uh, director of food services, staff, and parents. Um, so I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the changes uh, and I'll have you take a look at them uh, and ask any questions you may have about the proposed uh, policy changes. This did go to the policy subcommittee. Uh, the policy subcommittee reviewed this and approved the changes in June. And what, what I'd be asking for this evening is uh, generally, for a policy change, we'll have a first reading and a second reading. Uh, but since it has been reviewed by the policy subcommittee, I'm going to ask the committee to consider waiving the second reading and approving the policy tonight. Uh, that's ultimately your decision. Uh, by approving the policy tonight, you know we can say that it's in, in place for uh, the beginning of the school year. Uh, so let's take a look at some of the changes that are here. Um, I'm, I, I will do what you. I, I will do the will of the committee. We can go through them one by one, or I can just give you a couple minutes to take a look at them. Um, you know, and basically anything that's in red is an addition. Uh, so it's, there's some added language. So, like for example, in the first paragraph, uh, the Carver Public Schools are dedicated to the success of all students. As a community, it's essential that we promote good nutrition, fitness opportunities, and then we added, and social emotional skill development. Uh, that that language was in there before. Uh, as part of the total learning experience, through our school, students will gain an appreciation for health and fitness and develop strategies for lifelong healthy lifestyles. Again, the strategies for healthy lifestyles uh, was not previously in the policy. So that's just an example of anything that's in red is an addition. Um, anything that is 
has a strike through it is a redaction or a reduction within the policy. Um, a lot of the changes here really go back to that concept of tying kind of that safe and supportive schools, uh, social, emo social emotional health beyond just physical health uh, for students. Um, you know, so when you look down at um, educational standards, which is down the second page, Meredith, um, you know, so on educational standards, the following components are essential to a wellness education, school environment, fundamentals of fitness, community involvement, healthy habits, values of exercise, total body health, good nutrition, physical, emotional well-being, ongoing uh, program and assessment, um, you know, parental involvement. And you, so you'll see that most of the changes here are actually additions to the policy, uh, not necessarily a lot of reduction or taking pieces away. Um, the one piece that we did clarify through the policy subcommittee is if you go way down to page four, um, there was a little bit of a contradictory statement in the policy. Under fundraising? Under fundraising. So we, we've struck out the concept that says all fundraising projects during the school day will be encouraged to follow the district's nutrition standards. Because then the next sentence was all fundraising that includes food items will be required to follow the Massachusetts School Nutrition Regulations and Competitive Food. But we felt like that was a repetitive statement. Uh, so we just added in all fundraising during the school day. And it was a little, it was actually a little bit of a misstatement because it, before it said all fundraising that includes foods will follow the standards. And I don't know if we were living by that policy. You know, not, all, all, not all fundraising that happened in the district I don't know if cookie dough meets the standard. Uh, I don't know if the school's concession, I don't know if the concession stand at the football game uh, meets all the nutritional guidelines and standards. So we wanted to clarify that a little bit and say uh, all fundraising during the school day. Uh, so if we're going to run, anybody's going to run a fundraiser that's with things are being sold during the school day, we're going to make sure we meet the nutritional guidelines. Um, and then outside group fundraisers will not be allowed to sell food items before or during the school day. Uh, that's one of the big regulators you can't, you know, you can't be doing a fundraiser uh, where you're selling school d food during the school day. Uh, I, and so that, that piece was added in. So I, I didn't hit them all. Um, so again, I don't know if you have, people have questions or concerns about any specific change, or you can direct a question to myself or to Meredith or to Mike, um, or if you just want to take a minute to kind of look at the entire document. Well, I'll make a motion to uh, approve the wellness policy as presented tonight. Do you have a second? Um, any comments, questions? Do we need to motion to waive the second reading, or is that just to approve this? Yeah, we, the motion should actually, if, if you oh, could, you yeah. Either, is it a waive the second reading? Waive the second reading and okay. adopt the policy. I'll make a motion to waive the second reading and, adopt, and then yeah. adopt the wellness policy as presented. James and I went through this, and like I said, the only thing we found was the fundraising issue that got striked, struck through, so it's gone. <laughs> Okay, uh, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Oh, we're, so we're, we're doing away with the second reading. Yep, and we're approving. And we're gonna approve the policy. Mm -hmm. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Uh, we're gonna invite Mr. Martin back up. Can I just add one uh, sure. the wellness piece? Yeah. Um, so basically what really, it was, it was Meredith, myself, and Rudy who kind of spearheaded this group, and the group wants to take it a step further than just a, a wellness policy that sits in a policy manual. They have created a website that's going to be available to both the students, faculty, uh, and the community soon. And we've sort of pushed out a new Twitter page. Um, so we want it to just be more than just uh, this policy that sits in a, in a manual. So we're going to try to promote, promote things throughout the year. We're going to provide you more information. We'll get more information about the Twitter feed, the okay. website. At the Carbonite, I don't know if you were there, we were giving out water bottles and information sheets. I meant to bring them today, but I forgot, so you don't get your water bottle. Oh, well. I'm sorry. Um, but we're trying to get the word out that it's not, you know, it's a, it's a policy, okay. but it's going to be hopefully a way of life that we're going to promote throughout the district over the next uh, several months. I'd love to see updates on the website. This was, it's not up and running yet, right, the website? It's not. It'll be, linked, it'll be a link off of our website. So this is a sample of it. Now. I just pulled it up. Okay. Um, each part of the, each member of the committee kind of took a section that they felt passionate about. Um, and created a page, so it's in the process, but there's a wellness page, there's a mindfulness strategies page. Um, the nutrition page is actually great. It's, um, Vera, Vera Birkenbein worked a lot on that, and um, it's got a ton of information about types of foods. It's all sort of support stuff for parents and families. Um, 
That's you want great. to go to the tuition page, uh, Meredith. Mike, why don't you come up so we yeah. can hear you on the mic, please. But the, the idea simply is just to provide more resources for the community around nutrition, wellness, um, healthy lifestyles. So we're going to be pushing this out in the fall. And I know that there is a wellness fair at the elementary school. August 30th. August 30th. So we're going to be there with water bottles and more information. So uh, like I said, it's, we don't want it to be just a policy. We want it to be kind of a way of life. And we want to promote opportunities for students and families in the community. We're going to tie in with the rec department. So um, a lot of hopefully good, healthy fitness, wellness information that's great. coming up. That's, I think that's awesome. Good job. Look, look, look yeah. forward to seeing more of that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So again, we'll welcome uh, Mr. Martin back for high school handbook changes. Okay, before I get started on uh, a couple of the minor changes, um, part of our safe and supportive uh, group uh, decided that uh, one of the initiatives we're going to be looking at this year is really a, a major overhaul of our handbook, especially some of the language. And if you look at a lot of uh, high school handbooks, th there's a lot of zero tolerance policies and very punitive and out of school um, suspensions for relatively minor infractions. So uh, that's going to be probably a year long process for our safe and supportive group going forward. Um, what we have this year is really just focus on on um, some of the tardy policies that as a first year administrator at the middle high school, I thought were ineffective. It didn't really change students uh, behavior. Um, and you can see in some of the um, if you look at um, the kind of third paragraph down consequences for tardiness to school you're going to be suspended out of school for one day which doesn't really make sense if you're going to be late 12 times you're going to stay at home for a day so um, the stuff that's in italics here uh, is really uh, some of the language that um, the handbook subcommittee looked at um, a lot of those people that are in the handbook subcommittee are also in the safe and supportive committee. Uh, they just didn't like some of the uh, the word choices. So um, on the first section, tardiness to school, the stuff in italics, all students are expected to be in homeroom by 725. Students will be marked absent if they do not attend homeroom. Failures to report to homeroom or the main office will result in, attend in an attendance call home. Uh, they thought that language was a little more or maybe a little less punitive or accusatory um, than failure to report to homeroom or the main office will be considered truancy. You know, it's almost like we're, you know, you're you're guilty until proven innocent. So that was again really not a change in policy, just a change in in the language. And then the second piece, the consequences for tardiness to school. Um, this is really a, I wouldn't say a major change, but um, we're really looking at increments of five. And there's a lot of reasons students are tardy to school. A lot of the reasons, uh, especially for middle school and ninth and 10th grade students, isn't because of the student. It's really because of their parents. So it's bad if you know a student comes into school uh, tardy five times because you know there's something going on at home. There could be a family crisis, and as soon as they come in, where you know you get a detention, you get an extended day, you're, you're going to be suspended from school. Um, so again, the language uh, in italics in the second part is a little less punitive. Uh, there's going to be more check-ins, and we're never going to exclude a student from school for being tardy, uh, no matter how many times they're tardy. I, I don't think that's a uh, a punishment that kind of fits the crime, so to speak. Understood. Um, anybody have any questions, concerns? I have a couple questions. Mm -hmm. Is there so, do you have such thing as an excuse tardy? Um, that is a conversation we had this year. I know um, the Department of Ed, uh, Elementary and Secondary Education are kind of looking at tardies and absences as there's no such thing as excused or unexcused and that's really when when we put forth our our uh, data to the state they're just going to look at you know more so absences than tardies uh, we typically uh, I think the language in the handbook for uh, excused tardies is uh, a medical appointment or, or or a court date there's 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 really few um, um, excused tardy yeah. situations I'm just saying so if it was you know if a student went to 
court 10 times, would that fall under this or to be 10 unexcused tardies? Yeah. Is just, or is that up to your discretion? Well, again, you typically, you know, mo I would say 95% of the tardies that we deal with, kids are anywhere between five and 10 yeah. minutes late. So usually it wouldn't be a court date or a medical appointment. You yeah. know, oftentimes some of the seniors are coming in with Dunkin' Donuts and we can probably understand why they're tardy, so. Um, my other question, I, it's more of a comment on the, the, the tardiness of school, the top one. Mm -hmm. It doesn't explicitly state that 725 is tardy in the new, in the new writing of it. Yeah, and I, and I think that was, I think operationally, it's still going to look as at 725. Um, our, our main office staff, um, they're really on top of things as far as you know checking home rooms and we want to make sure that those attendance calls that go home are accurate rather than i i think we have to do a better job at um, maybe some of our record keeping just around attendance because what we were finding is that you know teachers some teachers at 725 they would mark you tardy other teachers 730 oh no i saw them in a home room they're technically not tardy mm -hmm. so I just didn't want there to be any and like ambiguity when it comes yep. to parents reading it and saying, "Oh, does that mean 7:45 is a tardy?" You know, I just wanted yep. to make sure it was clear for, you know, especially people coming in new into town. Yep. Just make sure there it's clear there. Thank and, you. And we can we can we can definitely put something in there that. Oh, sorry, as, as long as long as the students understand, the parents yeah. understand. And again, good. we have we'll have um, grade level meetings with all the students and. All right. Thank you. I like the wording on it. I like the changes myself. I mean. The, of an in-school suspension instead of a day off. Yeah. And it seems like you're getting the parents involved in both situations um, directly. Yes. So I like that. Yeah. And I think to, to kind of understand, and, you know, we just see, you know, John Smith has 10 tardies. Okay, you know, let's give them the consequence rather than get into that dialogue because there's a lot of um, very reasonable excuses as to why John Smith has 10 tardies. And then again, it's easy to say this one blanket policy covers every student, but we know uh, not everyone comes to, to school with the, with the same set of stuff. Right. Can you just briefly uh, touch on the social probation? I noticed that part. Yeah, so social probation is, um, and, and you can see it kind of comes in at 15, so I think there are 45 days uh, in a term. This resets at every term, so um, social probation is really a kind of, uh, uh, kind of the carrot and the stick type thing where if you know there's a dance or something extracurricular that uh, you want to attend if you can't make it into school in time and there's really not a reasonable excuse and we've we've kind of worked with you we may withhold your attendance at certain school events okay, and then yeah that's 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 how I read it too and that actually might be more effective than, of course yeah because they they're there with their friends and all of a sudden they can't come yeah, yeah. Right, thank you no problem Sure. Sorry, I have another question. I'm sorry. Yep. Um, have you ever considered any, what's the right words, academic consequence, not consequences, but like I've, I've seen districts that have like, it's called like an F6 policy where they have a certain amount of tardies or a certain amount of absences and that has an effect on their grade. Has that ever come up in a conversation um, when it comes to like a tardy policy or an <clears throat> absence policy? Uh, again, this is my, not, not even my first year in Carver and um, so, I, I, it may have been discussed uh, in prior years, but okay. you know that I'm new too, so it's fine. yeah. Just, that that, that kind of seems, you know, we have students who are tardy, and uh, in fact, there is a qualification where if you are, if you miss 15 minutes of class, it actually counts as you not being uh, given credit for that class, and that's going to tie to our graduation policy. That if you miss 18 classes, and again, it can be 18. 15 minute increments, yep. you could pass with an A, but that might prevent you from graduating. And again, to me, that seems overly punitive. No, I understand. I'm just curious if it was. Yeah. So I, go, I, going way back, so when I was assistant principal at high school, which was now many years ago, <laughs> uh, maybe 15, uh, it was, there was a point where we had a discussion about tying um, you know, some sort of academic consequence towards tiredness and attendance. Um, and I think there was just a concern about there was a concern about doing that. Um, so it, it is something that's been discussed at some point in the district, but not re not recently. All right, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, we do need a motion yeah, to so approve. I'll, the I can do that. That's, I'll move to 
approve the proposed revisions to the high school handbook. Do you have a second? I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Uh, FY20 school year calendar revision. Uh, so I'm proposing one revision to the calendar. Uh, we moved the March half day for parent-teacher conferences for the elementary school from Thursday, March 19th to Thursday, March 26th. Uh, when Ms. Maestas was establishing the terms for the elementary school, because uh, they have three 60-day terms, it was determined that the last day of term two would be March 18th. Uh, it just didn't seem to make sense to have uh, parent-teacher conferences the day after the term ended. Uh, by moving it back a week, it will give teachers to have the opportunity to have report cards done and have that be a part of the discussion uh, at parent-teacher conference on the 26th. Sure. Uh, so we'd like to propose to uh, move the half day for the elementary school from the 19th to the 26th. So I'll make a motion to approve the revised uh, school year calendar. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Okay. Uh, so we do have a couple of requests to recycle this month. Uh, world language textbooks. Uh, so these are outdated books that are no longer being used. You have a list of them. Uh, they're all Spanish books from 2000. Uh, so these books are not in use and have not been in use. Uh, and we've tried to do a resale of them and have been able to, un not, no one's interested in purchasing them. Because uh, sometimes there's a resale market for textbooks. Uh, it just hasn't been out there. Um, so that is the motion to dispose of those and recycle them. I'm going to combine both. So I'll and make the technology items as well. Yep. Yeah, I'll make a motion to, um, to recycle the word language textbooks and the technology items. I'll no second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. I, uh, we'll move on to Brad for our last two items. Actually, we'll let Brad talk about the uh, final budget transfers and the PCAT approval. We'll start budget transfers first. So in budget transfers, if you guys open up the Excel doc and then go under highlights, there'll be a couple lines that I will just quickly discuss. This is our closeout um, for FY19. There's a ton of total journal entries, but a lot of them are for $5 here, $5 there, but I'll go over a couple of the big ones. So if you look on line number seven, um, district-wide home instructional salaries. This is like the third year now that we've closed with a large balance. Um, what this originally is budgeted for is for kids who we have home tutoring or need MCAS help. Um, what this money has been able to do though, even though it's, it's gone unspent, we've been able each year to roll that over into our spent shortfall that we've had. So as much as I want to say, let's start taking away at this, this has kind of been a savior for us to have a little bit of balance on there. And you never know, we may have a, a, a position where we do have a lot more kids who need that home care instruction. Um, so you'll see on a year to year basis, that's been right around 40 to 50,000 budgeted. But for the course of the years, it's usually 20 to, um, it's usually 20,000 spent on it, but this year was only 10. Um, again, not a bad place to be because we had shortfalls in other areas to cover. Uh, line number 15 and 16, classroom aides at CS in the middle high school. Um, we had 13,000 savings in the elementary and then 10,000 in the middle high school and that's due to grants. Um, grant 240 came in a little bit higher than, excuse me, 140 came in a little bit higher than um, originally anticipated and it is 240, I said it right the first time. Um, that is our SPED para grant. Line item number 21 is the elementary math textbooks and related. I know we gave you guys an update late in the year that we purchased a new math curriculum for the elementary school. So you'll see there's $19,000 shortfall on that line item, but through other middle high school and elementary um, individual items for textbooks and um, just general purchasing for the middle high school supply material and the elementary, we're able to cover that. In line 29, um, we had a $29,000 savings in district-wide instructional software services. What happened is DESE has changed a lot of function codes for um, technology. They're actually starting to drill in pretty deep on where money spent technology-wise. So we, when we were looking at what we spent on technology, we felt a couple of the codes that we put on certain purchases belong in different line items. So for example, if you were to scroll down or scroll up to number one, excuse me, number, uh, line number two, and then if you scroll down to line number 81, um, both these tech line items had a amount overspend um, just because we felt that it classified what we were spending fit there more. Um, and again, that is one thing that DESE is starting to look at more and drill down on is how much is technology um, of a budget for every school district. Um, so that's actually gonna impact FY20 expenditures too, um, which we'll discuss later when we do the uh, um, adjustments for them them at the next meeting. 
Line item 39 and line item 40 is SPED contracted services and homeless, um, both for transportation. Um, we had a, it, we show a savings, but we also had a lot of transfers throughout the year on these two items. Um, this is constantly going to be a back and forth item because when a student actually is declared homeless, I usually open up a PO for the whole year because I'd rather be conservative than rather be short on that end. Um, so you'll see when we had at one point we had roughly estimated twenty seven thousand that we're going to spend on homeless transportation costs. They changed throughout the year, and we actually end up having eleven thousand dollars savings on that line item. Again, that's money we transferred into offset our special ed um, overage on tuitions, but that's going to constantly be a variable cost from year to year. Um, that I like to take the conservative approach on because technically we are responsible for them for the school full school year if they do stay classified as homeless. Line number 80 is just a grand total of all our 4,000, which is the facility series. Um, overall for the year, we had a $79,000 savings. The majority of this is based on one, the elementary school, we didn't need to purchase many. Um, there was no really money spent on elementary uh, building repairs and also utility lines for the majority of it. Um, again, this was 78,000 that we were able to transfer directly into offset our special ed costs. I know I gave you guys updates from the year, um, during the year about how short we were, which I'll get to in a minute for the actual sped line item for tuitions. But again, all this money we were able to go and we didn't have to hit the town for that reserve account, which is nice to roll over um, to next school year. And that actually feeds into the last one. If you look at line 88, for secondary tuitions and collaboratives. Um, that line was overspent this year by $207,000. Um, the makeup of the savings that we had from all the other lines I mentioned, we were able to offset that. But if we had fully expended every other line item um, to what we had budgeted, we'd be looking for a transfer from the town for that $207,000. Um, and that's really it. So we were able to, one, keep the 185000 that was already in that account. I believe there was what, another and one ten. ten. Um, into that account, yeah, so that has a nice time. reserve balance right now. Um, that if we do have a shortfall in future years, we'll it would also help us in budgeting for next year. Yep. So the carryover balance for ne to next year is one eighty five. One eighty five plus, plus one ten put in. Okay. There was a one eighty five balance in FY nineteen. So now it's like two ninety. Yep. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Right around three hundred. All right, so we're going to need a motion uh, uh, yeah, to I'm accept these, the budget transfers. I'll make a motion to approve the end of the year uh, FY19 final budget transfers. I have a second? Second. Any comments, questions, concerns? And we did um, return, we will return $5,700 to the town that went unspent overall. Okay, I have one question, Brad. Maybe you can just give me, shed some light on yep. uh, line 89. Um, was overspent by 32.5. Yep, that is representing the um, family. What's this? What's it reads? What's it called? The read the collaborative. Family? No, the uh, FSP program. FSP, yes. Family support program. Yep. So what that is, we originally <coughs> were going to anticipate paying that out of uh, school choice funds. Yep. But we were able to run that out of our regular operational budget, um, just because we had the money available for it. And so we we had a presentation yeah. about FSP yeah. uh, during the year last year. So but it overran for 32000 Because it wasn't, a, the original plan was not to pay it out of that line item. Oh, I see. But then Brad so made we a decision. We didn't have out. a line item just for that, right? It was built in the budget, but it was an offset. Okay. All right. I was just curious. Yep. Thank you. Uh, okay. So we have a motion and a second. All, all in favor of the budget transfers for fiscal year 19? Aye. 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 Yeah, was, I, Thank you, Brad. Uh, last one is uh, we're, we're going to, it's called a P card yeah. approval. Uh, and I'm just going to have, you have some information background, but I'll have Brad kind of give an overview of uh, what a P card is and why uh, he's interested in the district uh, uh, getting one. Yep. So a P card stands for a purchase card. Um, it's pretty simple, it operates almost essentially as a credit card. Um, a lot of districts are getting into this now because a lot of vendors, surprisingly, aren't accepting purchase orders. So it's m making people responsible to pay on their credit card for certain items. Um, I myself have found myself putting a lot of stuff on my credit card lately. Just and so we, and we, have, we have teachers putting things on their credit it's cards lot, yeah. and, we're, we're, and then we're reimbursing them. Yeah. So needs to say that gets us out of that process um, in terms of reimbursing and going through the backup material that's needed and everything. Well, how this works is MASBO, which is the Mass Association of School Business Officials, has linked together with um, Illinois' 
school business officials. Illinois has the set where they've worked with Bank of Montreal that operates as the, the bank that you purchase the card from. I believe it's a Visa card, but I could be, I could be wrong. Um, and what that does is school committee, you guys approve how many cards we get. And then it's usually up to either a policy or procedure manual um, for who sets and who gets those cards. Um, what we don't want to do right now is I don't want to open it up to every department. A lot of districts have, like larger school districts will have a department head have a card with their name on and everything and spending limits. I really want to get a feel for how it all works. So I'd like to limit to just one card for our central office, me and Scott, to have right now to get one full year of seeing how it goes. Um, one thing I'd like to do eventually is if it, if it does work out well is run it out of student activities. Um, what this does is it gives you one bill to pay at the end of the month rather than cut 50 different checks that people are running around for. Um, so long term, this makes sense for a lot of things. But until we have a trial year, I don't want to expand. Well, I don't know exactly how it's going to work. Um, so it could also help some of our larger purchases that we need to make. Correct. Like All the prom or the grad bash trip or which is why you'll see uh, that Six Flags trip for the eighth grade that someone does have to put down their credit card. Which is why you'll see that dollar amount that I'm requesting, 40000 so large. But we have grad bash that costs, we cut a $30,000 check for. And part of the issue that happens there is that even though it's still student activity account, student activity account can then cut a check. I can put it with the check cut to um, from the town to the company and send them together. What happens is our school committee policy right now limits how much money we can have in our checking on both our checking and savings account for student activities. So when we actually cut a check, what sometimes happens is it's a busy time in the spring. We'll cut three checks for $20,000 each for large ticket items that the transfer doesn't actually happen on time because it has to go through school committee approval and whatnot. And by the time the check's actually received, it has to go to town. We, we've come up short on a couple times in terms of cash flow balance, even though we have it, just a matter of getting it from our savings into our checking. This will help eliminate that. Mm -hmm. um, and also, again, it helps eliminate a lot of the um, purchases that we have to put on credit cards and go through the reimbursement process. And chasing paperwork from people is not fun. Um, so this will help eliminate that. So, so a couple of things here is, A, the school committee would be saying the limit. Right now, you'd be setting who has access to a card. And we're proposing Brad and I. Uh, so I, any purchase that we made on the car would have to go through one of us. Um, and then we can see how it goes. Uh, and then if we feel like it's been a positive program, we could look to expand it and, and establish a more formalized policy around uh, who would have access to cards and who could use them. Yeah. I have a lot of sample template policies, but they're all so specific on by school, depending on the levels that they give the cards out, um, that it makes really no sense for us to have one right now, in my opinion. Um, but. That's up to you guys. Are you, uh, when are you looking to get this, um, the actual card active and ready um, to go? They said it takes anywhere from two to four weeks. It, once you guys approve, I need you guys to sign that in your original form. All right. Um, anybody have any questions on this? Is the, pl is the plan to, carry, to have the card carry a zero, zero balance going month to month so you're not getting hit with interest charges on the card? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's going to be pay, yeah. pay, pay to go. And honestly, <laughs> every, every purchase will still be charged to a line item. Yeah. So it's not like it's money that we don't like. I don't want to say know where it's coming from, but it'll all have balanced out where we charge that actually bill invoice to. I, my, for my mind, the biggest issue this solves is it, there. It, it is amazing how many times we'll go to a vendor and they'll say we don't accept POs, and then it becomes well, how do you pay? Yeah. And people are taking out their credit cards and paying for things, uh, which I don't think is a great setup. So going forward, if we adopted this. If a teacher wanted to buy something, or they, they would normally buy it with their credit card or, or a staff member, now they would come to you and have them use, have, use, you use, use this card? <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, in certain circumstances where there's no, where the company doesn't accept the PO, absolutely. Yeah. But I want to keep this very minimal right now just to see how the flow works on okay. it. And still, they still would need prior, prior teacher approval. can't just go to CVS and buy $20 worth of things. They need prior approval by their administrator. Okay. And that's the, that will still be the day-to-day -day function. And so something we were going to buy and pay for out of the budget anyhow. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. All right. I have, uh, I don't know, this might be a ridiculous question, but I'll go with it anyways. Bank of Montreal yep. is a foreign bank. Yep. So is there any issues with it being an out-of-country bank that's, that's responsible? No. I, I, the, when Illinois' ASBO put out the bid, Bank of America, or excuse me, Montreal Bank 
whatever major credit card they're linked to must have offered the best rebate package, I'm assuming. Um, so how that works is the state of Mass will fall under an umbrella and the Bank of Montreal will say, okay, you guys in rewards have earned a million dollars. They'll take that money that, Ma Masbo will take the money that is allocated towards the P card for what our rewards are. They break that up by what was spent by town and we actually get a check back for that. I was um, gonna ask if there was a cash back exactly, option. Exactly, yeah, or something there like is. That. There is. Yeah. So we can have our school committee. I thought you just that. chose the Bank of Montreal because you wanted free no. uh, Canadians tickets no. or something. No. <laughs> no, no, that's directly through the, the P card company set up. Okay. Again, I don't know how they chose them, but they're the vendor that they use. I just wanted to check it. Was just, yeah. All right, so I'll make a motion to uh, that we authorize the Chief Operations and Finance Officer to enter an agreement with the Bank of Montreal for, per for the purchasing card in the amount of $40,000. Second? Yep. Second. We have a motion and a second. I have one more question. Um, if this is approved, I don't know how the rest of the committee would feel, but I would like to see you guys are the only two, only two are going to be using it. But I, can I get a, can we get re reports on monthly purchases at our meetings? Yes, yeah, it'll be actually it'll be in the um, or, yeah we have the package. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Okay. Oh, yeah, great. Okay, yep. terrific. Do All we right. need to put anything in the motion about Scott and Brad being the only person? You certainly can. You would can it, would that, that be? Do we have to? I mean, probably, I'm just curious. Well, right now, until that we have to approve. It, it, you could put in the motion that Brad or I have to approve the purchase. Yeah. Oh, you want to add that or modify your motion that Scott and Brad are authorized? Okay. Which honestly, I mean, we have. We're the only ones that approve purchases right now, anyway. Right. That's fine. I'd, yeah. Right. And then we're going to see. I think. No, that's fine. Then that's fine. Let's go. All right. Well, you want to leave it the way it is? Yeah. yeah okay. All right. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. All right, and that, I think that brings a close to our agenda for the evening. And maybe we can look at a, if we need to, look at a policy on that as we go forward. Yeah, I should. I want to, honestly, I want to get this, if it rolls the right way, I want to have this ASAP because I think this solves a lot of our issues mm -hmm. with, uh, much more than just central office. Okay. So, and we will need a policy or procedure manual along the way. All right, so we got a reports from the school committee. Anybody have any updates or would say anything? No, I just want to wish faculty, staff, uh, kids, um, you know, great start to the school year so we'll uh we will be convening again uh, the 12th so the kids yes. will already be back so have a great labor day weekend and um you know a great start to the school year yeah i'm i'm ex actually excited to hear about the new volleyball team that's coming out i know we didn't talk about that at all but i think that's when i read about that i think that's a really cool thing i like to hear just some some updates on how that's going and how the uh, so the and, well, and one thing and stuff um, going, so. I'm going to talk to <clears throat> so I think last year we started to fade with both the student council update and the captain's council update so I'm really going to make a push to uh, have a captain's council and a student council representative at each school committee meeting uh, to discuss yeah. even more so the captain's council to discuss what's happening in the athletic program and promoting yeah. that and so volleyball will be part of that but obviously all yeah. the athletic programs. But I think it's cool that's that's a nice new offering I like that there's a lot of interest good 25 plus kids that's great to to go. that's okay. great stuff yeah, just one thing um, I also want to wish everyone a safe and successful back to school time and I just want to please urge people to have patience if you get stuck behind a school bus and please don't pass them that's right. um, it is dangerous it will just add a few moments to your schedule and everyone can move on their way so just please be mindful of school buses because they'll be on the roads soon that's all thank Very you good. well I too like to <clears throat> wish everybody a, a good good start of the school year if you won't see us till we get back uh, until you get back but I will say as I always say in, in this at this meeting the summer's not over yet kids <laughs> grab the rest of it the, as hard as you can um, the other, other thing I'd like to bring up is I mentioned to Scott and hopefully for our next meeting we can have it is a list of every activity that's going to be going on in all the schools for all of our members here and a copy for the paper so the public can be fully aware of everything that's going on in our, our wonderful schools with our kids. All right, so uh, yeah. have a good night, everybody. Uh, and then I just, wa I just want to mention that um, we do the finance committee is meeting on Thursday yes. night as part of the sustainability committee. So I know uh, Andy, you're, are, you're a representative, and then we talked about having a floating representative. Yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to throw that out there. That's Thursday night at 7 o'clock so for any member of the school committee. Right, that's good. Like I'm glad you brought that up. Um, if anybody's available, 
Uh, James is sick right now, so we're, that's why he's not here tonight. But um, is this Thursday? This, this Thursday, Thursday, Thursday 7 22nd at 7. So if anybody could make it with me, that would be great. Just let me know. And then we also, I think everybody knows this because uh, Andy communicated with everybody just so, but there is going to be a joint meeting of the school committee and the select board yes. on Thursday, September 26th at 7 o'clock uh, here. Yeah, that's a, after communicating with all of you and the selectmen, that's the day we, everyone could do. That works. Yep. All right. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. I move to have adjourn. a great night. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Sorry. Yeah. Move to adjourn. <laughs> you have a, have a, uh, all in favor of adjourning? Aye. 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 Second. Yes. Thank you. <laughs>